Welcome to the Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Every episode is free on our website at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Also learn about upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. To support Murder in 20, feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. And we couldn't do this podcast without all our sources, which we acknowledge throughout the podcast and are listed on our website. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. In California, they are called the Devil Winds of Santa Ana. The high winds down power lines and spread sparks at lightning speed. The wildfires ravage the valleys and climb the mountains until the flames lick at the rooftops and consume everything in their path. When the afterglow of the fire fades to darkness, all that's left are the black charred remnants of lives once lived. The California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection states that in the first eight and a half months of 2020, there have been over 6,300 fires. That's an increase of 54% from 2019, and the year isn't over. In the 1980s, California was experiencing a large number of fires. Authorities determined that many were arson. Arsonists range from kids starting fires for fun, or those who are angry and getting even. Then there's the pyromaniacs who do it for sexual gratification. But the worst is a firefighter whose goal is to be the hero. An experienced arsonist is a scary villain. With each fire, they become more elusive. They are there when the fire starts to crackle and the flames rise. Then as the heat intensifies and the glows start to roar, they step back, but never away. For an arsonist is often about power. Their evil drive to destroy what is around them. The very nature of their crime means evidence is often destroyed. In early October 1984, as fires ravaged California, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger promised that the state would catch and punish arsonists. The United Press International reported, and I quote, We will hunt down the people responsible. We will not fail. If I were one of those people who started the fire, I would not sleep soundly. Now imagine that in Arnold's Terminator voice. Only days later on Wednesday, October 10th, in South Pasadena's Old Home Center, the large shopping hardware outlet was open late. As customers wandered the aisle shopping, they had no idea a fire was smoldering. At 8 p.m., it erupted near the paints of flammable solvents and quickly spread through the west end of the 42,000-square-foot building. As the fire spread, the flammable liquids exploded and fire flashed across the ceiling. The west end of the store contained no fire sprinklers, which the fire code didn't require at the time. Fire crews arrived within three minutes to find the west end fully ablaze with flames shooting high into the night sky. At one point, the fire burned so hot, firefighters hosed down their fire engines to stop them from exploding. Up to 18 employees fled the store, along with about 10 customers. A group was following an employee trying to escape the flames when he heard a loud noise and looked behind him to see the roof had caved in on the group. Heavy smoke billowed. 32 fire companies responded to the fire, with over 120 firefighters. By 10.30 p.m., they had finally contained the fire. The next morning, the Sheriff's Department, Homicide, and Arson Investigators arrived. Search dogs were brought in and sniffed through the charred wreckage. Four people were missing. Two cars believed to be belonging to the missing sat eerily in the parking lot. A dozen relatives of the missing had gathered outside, hoping and waiting. A crane was brought in to knock down the front wall that was still standing but unstable. Inside, the store ashes were piled up two feet high. Around 4 p.m., two adult bodies were found. Only seven feet from the emergency exit door. Within an hour, two more bodies were found 40 feet away, one adult and a child. In all, four charred bodies were recovered from the old fire. 
Although arson had been considered, that evening after authorities talked to witnesses and viewed photos taken from the sheriff's helicopter, they were convinced it had been an accident. Financial losses were estimated to be several million dollars. Investigators would later take another look at the cause of that fire. On Friday, the coroner's office identified the four victims, employees Carolyn Krause and Jimmy Satina. They were only 26 and 17. Customer Ada Deal was shopping with her two-year-old grandson, Matthew Troydell. The lead arson investigator at the Oles Fire was John Orr, a family man with a wife and two young daughters. His first ambition was to be a police officer, but when he failed the entrance exam, he joined the Glendale Fire Department in 1974 and became an arson investigator six years later. He was also an inspiring author, writing a novel called Point of Origin, but a firefighter named Arson Stiles, who was also a serial arsonist. John had devoted his life to arson. In January 1987, Southern California experienced a rash of suspicious fires. The Kraft Mart in Bakersfield, the Family Bargain Center in Tulare, and two Hancock fabric stores. One in Fresno, the other in Bakersfield, which was quickly determined to be arson. At the craft store, investigators found a delayed fire starter made from a cigarette, matches, a rubber band, and one piece of yellow lined paper that had been placed among the artificial flowers. Their prolific arsonist became known as the Pillow Pyro for targeting stores that sold flammable items like crafts, fabrics, and linens. A couple months later, when a federal expert examined the evidence, they found a fingerprint on that yellow piece of paper. One lonely fingerprint from the ring finger of a left hand. The fingerprint was retained in evidence and locked away for safekeeping. In 1989, six suspicious fires occurred in the Central Coast area. It coincided with an arson conference in nearby Pacific Grove. The Los Angeles Times reported that Bakersfield Fire Department Captain Marvin Casey began to suspect the arsonist was one of their own. He got a list of attendees from both the Fresno and Pacific Grove conferences and noticed 10 people had attended both. John Orr was number five on that list. Federal experts were now reviewing that lone fingerprint found two years earlier at the craft store, but a match wasn't found in their database. That could mean their suspect hadn't been arrested before. The evidence was put back in storage. In June 1990, fires were again ravaging Southern California. The numbers were staggering. The Press Democrat reported that fires ignited and crackled across the state, ravaging 647 homes and buildings and scorching 14,000 acres. Fires were being battled in San Bernardino, Riverside, Orange County, San Diego, Glendale, and Santa Barbara. Arson was suspected in at least nine of the fires. On the 27th, the temperature bubbled near 105 degrees. The Los Angeles Times reported that the Santa Barbara fire was a wind-whipped inferno that roared out of the rugged hills above town, destroying 427 homes and 11 public buildings. Tragically, one person died, a 37-year-old woman who sought shelter from the flames in a creek behind her house. The blaze, started by an arsonist, was the most destructive fire in over 30 years in Southern California and caused $250 million in damages. The Glendale Fire was also lit by an arsonist who set fire in the College Hills area. Darlene Gill told the Sacramento Bee that in less than 10 minutes the flames had reached her house and gutted its 4,000 square feet. Her Lincoln Continental reduced to a metal carcass. None of the houses had a chance, she said. The California governor declared a state of emergency. By the time the fire had ended, its reign of terror, 66 homes had been destroyed or damaged at a cost of $19 million. Glendale's fire captain John Orr told the signal that arson is the only crime where the suspect sticks around, so they carefully interview anyone who was on hand when the fires began, and that the fires were believed to be set by pyromaniacs for sexual gratification or who want attention or perhaps to become firefighters. Then December 10th, 100-foot flames raged in Highland Park as the People's Department store was consumed by fire. The roof collapsed. Firefighters fought the fire for almost three hours. Six people were injured, and it caused $1.5 million in damages. 
Four days later, the Builders Emporium in North Hollywood went up in flames. The cause of both fires was under investigation. Spring of 1991 started off with more fires, including the March 27th fire at the DN Yardage outlet in Lawndale with massive flames and smoke. Firefighters took almost three hours to extinguish the flames that caused $600,000 in damages. Luckily, no one was injured in the fire. The cause was under investigation. Federal agents began investigating the arson fires plaguing Southern California, and locally, an arson task force was formed that included the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, the Glendale Police Department, and the Burbank and Los Angeles Fire Departments. Arson investigators in Bakersfield and Los Angeles had also begun sharing information. Through the summer, there had been five bush fires in the Glendale and La Cañada areas. On September 30th, just as summer was winding down, three brush fires erupted within an hour of each other along the freeway. Arson investigator Joe Lopez of the Glendale Fire Department told the Los Angeles Times that accidental causes had been ruled out. There are no power lines. There is nothing electrical there. All the fires had been set in bushy areas close to major roads on weekday afternoons. It's the same type of method. It's definitely a pattern. John Orr, an arson investigator in Glendale, said he believed the fires could be the work of the same person who set last year's College Hills fire, and that it's a real tough thing to track down an arsonist, particularly a serial arsonist with time-delayed devices. It's just a cat-and-mouse game. Fire officials in Glendale were now videotaping the crowds that gathered around the fires, hoping to spot a suspect. Because arsonists can't resist the excitement of watching their fires burn and seeing the destruction, then investigators caught a lucky break. At a fire at a vacant lot a few weeks earlier, they found two types of time-delayed devices. A third device was recovered from a brush fire near a hospital. In the beginning of October, the Californian reported that with the temperatures forecasted to reach 100 degrees Fahrenheit, officials were bracing for a firestorm. And Glendale Fire Captain John Orr said the worst of Wednesday's fires which destroyed a house in Chevy Chase Canyon, was believed to have been set by an arsonist. He also said the Griffith Park fire appeared arson-related, as did a fire on Tuesday near the Rolls Bowl in Pasadena. This is definitely arson, Orr said. It appears to be started by the same person. Then on November 22nd, fire destroyed a piece of television history. On the Warner Brothers set for the Waltons, fire erupted and destroyed the house and part of the barn used for the show. Who can forget Walton's Mountain and the goodnight serenade of John Boy, Mary Ellen, Elizabeth, Aaron, Jason, Ben, and Jim Bob. The next day, another brush fire erupted in the La Cunetta Flint Ridge Montrose area. Meanwhile, five fingerprint specialists re-examined the print found on that yellow piece of paper from the craft store five years earlier, and this time, they found a match. Two weeks later, on December 4th, headlines around California lit up with the news that a Glendale fire investigator had been charged in three store blazes. John Orr was charged with arson for three fires between December 1990 and March 1991 at the People's Department Store, the Builders Emporium, and the DM Yardage Outlet. Investigators had employees who witnessed John at or near the three store fires, and that fingerprint? It was a match to John. Officials also suspected him in at least another 12 fires. After John was arrested, federal officials searched his home, office, and car. They found several types of incendiary devices and videotapes of arson fires that were used for training. The interesting thing about the videotapes was that John had filmed the fire at the People's Department Store and a second fire in Burbank, but those fires were outside his jurisdiction, and no local firefighters had taken that video. Most fires had been set using a time-delayed device, using a cigarette, matches, a rubber band, and yellow-lined paper. In searching John's briefcase, officials found the first three items, then they found a pad of yellow-lined paper under the floor mat in his car. The affidavit revealed that officials had attached an electronic tracking device to his car so they could track him when he traveled to conferences. 
John had educated his peers at seminars and was a mentor to his firefighting colleagues who were stunned. During his 17 years as an arson investigator in Glendale, he had been relied upon for his expertise and his uncanny ability to find the fire's point of origin. Then two weeks later, on December 17th, another bombshell dropped. The charges against John were increased to five counts of arson and three attempted arsons. Charges were added for Cornet Hardware, Coast to Coast Hardware, and a thrifty drug store. Attempted arson was added for the Pacific Home Improvement Center and Stats Floral Supply. A week later, in a courtroom in Los Angeles, John pled innocent to all eight counts of arson. He was released on $50,000 bail and was under house arrest and electronically monitored. Tom Probst, a young fire prevention inspector with the Glendale Fire Department in the early 90s, told Newsweek he recounted arriving at the site of a brush fire in a canyon area near Glendale, and as always, or was already there. He was shouting stuff like, we need to get crews above and giving directions. He always knew where the fire hydrants were. We just thought, wow, this guy has such knowledge. He was miraculously fast at finding the causes of fires. He could dig through the ashes, narrow it down, and we'd be like, man, you're good. In January 1992, a federal grand jury charged John Orr with another five arson charges for fires at five stores in January 1987 while he was attending an arson conference in Fresno. One fictional fire in his novel happened at a Kmart shopping center in Fresno. Coincidentally, so did a real fire. Two of the fabric stores in his novel that were set on fire were from the same chain. So were two fires in real life. Prosecutors felt the similarities in the fictional fires and the real fires was no coincidence. Newsweek featured a passage from his novel. To Aaron, the smoke was beautiful, causing his heart rate to quicken and his breathing to come in shallow gasps. He was trying to control his outward appearance and looked normal to anyone around him. He looked around and saw nothing. The lot was empty. He relaxed, watching the fire. John was proud of his novel and let his supervisor at work read it. It provided glimpses of the arsonist's motives as he recounted the sexual pleasure he got from the fires. In March, John's lawyer Douglas McCann was doing his best to have two key pieces of evidence thrown out. The fingerprint found on the yellow piece of paper and John's unpublished 418-page novel. A month later, a judge ruled that the fingerprint was in, and the novel was out. Prosecutors weren't happy with the ruling on the novel and appealed it. They argued that the fires John wrote about were the same fires he had been charged with. Three months later, a judge ruled it was back in. After being charged, John was on unpaid leave from the Glendale Fire Department, his employment pending the outcome of his trial. When his trial got underway in early July 1992 for the second case against him, John claimed it was a conspiracy, that he was an innocent man. Prosecutors focused on the time delay devices rigged to give the arson enough time to place it and leave the scene. On the last day of July, he was found guilty on three of the charges and acquitted on two. His guilty verdicts were for the Family Bargain Center, the Craft Mart, and the Hancock Fabric Store in Bakersfield. In the end, jurors said it wasn't the novel that convinced them. It was the fingerprint. John was taken to the Fresno County Jail. The Glendale Fire Department fired him, and on November 2nd, a judge sentenced John to 30 years in federal prison. Four months later, in March 1993, John surprised everyone when he pled guilty to three of the eight charges in the first case against him. He pled guilty to the fire at the Builders Emporium and two other fires along the Pacific Coast Highway. He was sentenced to eight years in prison, which would be served concurrently with his 30-year term. Almost two years went by. In January 1995, prosecutors laid 26 new charges, 18 for the College Hills fire that destroyed 66 homes, three charges for brush fires in Glendale and La Cañada, and one for the Walton studio. And for the first time, it included a murder charge. Actually, four charges for the murders of Carolyn Krauss, Jamie Satina, Ada Deal, and Matthew Troidil in the Olds Home Center fire. 
In May 1998, John's trial began. He sat emotionless in the courtroom. His lawyer would argue that yes, he did plead guilty to three fires. And yes, he wrote a novel that was similar to some of the fires. But he wasn't responsible for the old fire. He argued that the fire wasn't caused by arson. The Los Angeles Times reported that with jurors listening attentively, Prosecutor Michael Cabrill read from John's unpublished novel, The last thing she heard was a tremendous roar as the fire burned through the roof and vented to the outside. The smoke momentarily lifted, but was then replaced by solid fire as the entire contents of the annex exploded into flames. Their last breaths were of 800 degree heat that seared their throats closed. On June 27th, 14 years after the old fire, John was found guilty on all four counts of murder. The prosecutor wanted the death penalty. Why should he be left to live and derive satisfaction from reliving the memory of those he'd killed? Why should he live when they didn't? John's parents and daughter Lori testified at his sentencing hearing. Perhaps that swayed the jury. The jury was deadlocked eight to four, in favor of the death sentence, a unanimous vote was required. The prosecutors had a decision to make. Retry the penalty phase and hope for a better outcome, or accept what they had. They agreed to the life term. John was sentenced to four consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. In addition, he received 20 years for the remaining charges of arson. The California Sun reported that John's supporters gradually fell away, his daughter Lori, who said she'd taken his innocence for granted, but over time doubts crept in. She began to regard her father as a sociopath and a master manipulator and cut him out of her life. John attempted to have his convictions overturned, but lost. By the time the ashes had settled, investigators believed he had started more than 2,000 fires throughout California over seven years. In 2002, a novel was released about John Orr and his sixth sense for finding the origin of fires. Joseph Wamba's novel, Fire Lover, recounts how John would show up at a fire scene, gaze at the area, stroke his mustache, and like a water seeker with a divining rod, say, I believe the point of origin is there. And sure enough, he'd be right. John Orr will never get the type of fame he was seeking, his novel was never published. The only writing the 71-year-old does now is between California's prison walls. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Gary Hilton, a serial killer with a mean streak. The 61-year-old drifter never fit in anywhere except in the woods. There, he felt powerful. The sadistic killer spread his wrath of anger over three states before he was captured. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. And every week, we announce upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until then, stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers. Bye.